Hello everyone, I'm going to kind of switch gears here this morning from the bigger picture to the more practical applications of on-site reuse systems in Austin. First I'll give a little background about on-site reuse systems, talk about some drivers to use them, definitions in the regulatory landscape associated with these systems, and then talk about the evolution of on-site reuse some previous regulations, um, some published guidance that the city has provided, and then looking ahead to um, future. And then uh, finally, I'll talk about some specific projects and outcomes, um, some systems that the city of Austin has commissioned, uh, talk about a dual plumbing study that we, uh, the city is partnering with the Water Research Foundation to help determine some costs for associated with these systems, and then a few other on-site reuse initiatives. So let's get started. Okay, in 2014, the Water uh, Research Foundation did a, a study, or was more of a series of, of workshops and uh, surveys that they sent out to utilities across um, the U.S. to determine um, who was doing integrated water management, who was looking at alternative water supplies to try and diversify their water supply portfolios, and um, asking them why they were doing that. And so this is the kind of the list of um, drivers that all these other utilities uh, listed for why they were looking at alternative water sources. Climate ch change impacts are one of them. Director Mazaros talked about some of these that Austin Water is facing as well. Uh, water shortages and drought, catastrophic events such as floods and hurricanes, degradation of water quality, reliability and redundancy limitations. Um, population growth with reduced consumption and then demands for lower cost solutions. And so um, the Water Forward Plan, Austin's 100-year integrated water resource plan that's already been mentioned and that um, we'll touch on this afternoon during the workshops as well. Uh, the goal of that plan was to ensure a resilient water future through future population growth, the drought and climate change. And the plan embraced a fit-for-purpose approach to meet non-potable demands with non-potable sources. And on-site water reuse is a key strategy in Water Forward to meet our future water reuse goals. And you can see in the graph below, the, the blue piece of the pie is drinking water supply um, that we plan to meet with drinking water uh, demands. And then the gray portion is drinking water supply meeting non-drinking water demand. And then in purple, we have non-drinking water supply meeting uh, non-drinking water demand. And so over time, you can see that we're going to shift from using drinking water for non-potable applications to um, using uh, alternative water sources that are fit for purpose to be able to meet those demands and conserve our potable water supplies. So the alternative water sources that we'll be talking about today are rainwater, which is precipitation collected from roof surfaces or other above ground structures, stormwater, which is precipitation collected at or below grade surfaces, we have condensate water, which is water produced in a heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system as a result of evaporative cooling. Gray water is wastewater from showers and bathtubs and hand washing lavatories and th sinks that are used for um, disposal of household products, but it doesn't include toilet waste and things that contain high organic matter. That is what black water is, uh, toilet waste and things like that. And then on-site water reuse systems, uh, the kind of concept behind those are that you would collect either one or multiple of these alternative water sources. You would put them through some sort of on-site uh, treatment system, clean them up, purify them, um, so that you can use them for um, non-potable purposes, such as irrigation and landscape uh, maintenance, toilet flushing, clothes washing, cooling towers, and process water. And the regulatory landscape that exists today um, is broken up by water source and then the reuse type. So rainwater through gray water has its own set of regulations for non-potable applications. And black water has its own special set of rules for non-potable applications. And then there's also rainwater that's allowed to be used for potable purposes, but that's, we're not going to really talk about that today. 
there are then state and local codes that apply to, to those different uh, water sources and those applications, and that's kind of the, the regulatory landscape as it exists today. But if we talk about the evolution of that regulatory landscape, it hasn't always looked like this. There's a lot of work that has gone into getting us to this point. I have been working with Austin Water for just over nine years now. And um, when I first started here, the attitudes towards um, on-site reuse and gray water in particular have changed dramatically. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with the drivers that were mentioned today. Um, initially, uh, gray water and these other alternative waters were viewed as waste, waste that we have to get rid of, dispose of, but that thinking has shifted towards viewing these waters as a resource that can be harnessed for a specific need to meet our non-potable water demands. And so talking about some of the previous regulations, the first time you saw gray water systems show up was actually within uh, Chapter 210 of the Texas Administrative Code, which is actually a rule set built for municipal reclaimed water systems, big systems, industrial reuse systems. And then in 2005, they stuck a, um, a little section in there that had to do with domestic gray water systems. And basically, those regulations said that um, for a household, if you use less than 400 gallons per day of gray water, you didn't need a permit or inspection, and you can just use that for outdoor use. Um, but practically speaking, uh, this is a photo from somewhere in Austin. Um, our experience with gray water was that it, if a site had a septic system and they wanted to prolong the life of that septic system, they would um, reroute their laundry line onto the ground so that the flow wouldn't go into the septic system and then it would kind of pool and pond um, and maybe create a habitat for mosquitoes. So that was kind of the view at the time of like what was gray water for um, regulators at, uh, at Austin Water. Then in 2009, uh, the uh, Uniform Plumbing Code, uh, the rewrite, the city adopts the plumbing code with local amendments as its uh, local regulations for plumbing systems and design, and that's currently where local regulations exist for on-site reuse. And so the 2009 version of the Uniform Plumbing Code, also called the UPC, is where um, non-potable water reuse systems showed up, and then at that time they addressed gray water and also municipal reclaimed water systems. And you can see in here they even had some guidance on how to design your systems. You had a tank, you would have some uh, distributing valves and then some drain fields. And um, this looks very much like a septic system kind of design. And again, we're kind of treating gray water as just a wastewater and disposal system early on. But with the 2012 adoption, or the 2012 version of the rules, um, that's when we saw the addition of condensate and other on-site reuses, re, uh, alternative water sources show up into that section of code. Um, and there was also some uh, stakeholder involvement that went into crafting those rules. Some of you in this room may have been involved in that. Um, there was a council-initiated gray water working group. Um, some uh, members of the community had kind of noticed that those previous gray water rules may, didn't really allow for you to beneficially reuse the gray water like, like you would intend to. The pipes were buried too deep, the pipes were too big. Um, and so this working group identified seven technical impediments to gray water use in Austin, and they recommended addressing um, those impediments uh, through some amendments to the, the Uniform Plumbing Code. And then the group also identified six process and information related impediments to gray water use. And so we developed a one-stop permit process for auxiliary water, um, also known as alternative water. And uh, they decided that all information related to on-site reuse will be coordinated through Austin Water's Conservation Department, our division, excuse me, and that we would, uh, the city and Austin Water would do plan for additional <coughs> outreach and education components. Um, and that's where you saw the laundry to landscape systems kind of show up, uh, which showed you how to properly plumb your gray water line to reuse that water. 
And, you know, in 2012, again, the drought of 2011 was kind of a, one of the drivers to get us to relook at those regulations and make it so that people could use gray water easier. And then in 2016, uh, there was a revision of that, that chapter of the Texas Administrative Code that addressed gray water. That's where you um, saw these other alternative on-site waters show up, condensate, um, stormwater, gray water, things like that. And uh, that work was actually um, uh, instigated by uh, the state congressional rep, Donna Howard, through, some, uh, uh, through the Texas legislature. And she worked with uh, Austin Water staff to help develop those rules and regulations. And so Austin Water was a part of advancing that uh, code at the state level as well. And then in 2017, we have some amendments of the Uniform Mechanical Code. Um, which is, uh, specifies who is required to reuse um, condensate in their developments. Um, and so bigger developments with a certain cooling capacity, they're required to now capture their condensate and then reuse it for non-potable purposes um, beneficially. And then the city published an informational bulletin in 2018 to kind of provide some published guidance on how you can do that effectively. Um, and then we've also published in 2018 some on-site reuse guides for both multifamily and commercial developments as well as single-family developments. And these guides contain information about allowed usages and treatment requirements for these alternative waters. They explain the permitting steps for how you could go about getting one of these systems permitted. And then it contains information about qualifying rebates and our programs to help incentivize this water reuse. And so this information is just guides to help developers and the development community be able to implement these systems into their, into their particular developments. And so looking ahead, uh, we kind of covered where all the various regulations associated with on-site reuse live. And one of um, our future projects is, is, and we'll talk about this later today in the workshop, is to combine all of these different regulations and put them into one sort of rule set where you can find them and make it easier to understand and implement um, as you try to design these projects in your building. And then um, Another kind of initiative that the City of Austin is involved in is the National Blue Ribbon Commission for On-Site Non-Potable Water Systems. Um, this commission advances best management practices to support the use of on-site non-potable water systems within individual buildings or at the local scale. And the commission is committed to protecting public health and the environment and sustainably managing water now and for future generations. And so we have staff members who've been directly involved in this commission work, uh, which has been focused on providing more guidance, regulatory guidance, management guidance, and really just developing a whole new framework for how these systems should be regulated and implemented. And they've published a lot of great guidance, model ordinances, they've come up with a risk-based framework for the development of public health guidance, and um, the city has relied a lot on these uh, resources as they're starting to shape their program. Okay, some specific projects and outcomes. I'm just going to touch on these um, briefly because we have um, uh, deeper dives presentations into these systems um, following this presentation. So the city of Austin is building a new planning and development review center. It's going to be the interface with the development community where you come get all your permits for your buildings and site plans and things like that. And that building is going to incorporate a black water and rainwater reuse system. Uh, the black water treatment system is a 5,000 5, gallon per day black water treatment system that can serve 1,000 employees. And then there's a 40,000 gallon rainwater cistern, um, and sorry, that, that black water is going to be treated for reuse for toilet flushing and should meet all of the toilet flushing demands for the building. And then the rainwater system will be dedicated to irrigation um, in and around the building. And it's estimated to save over 1 million gallons of potable water each year. Uh, the budget for that project is 1.5 million, um, and the goal is to. Uh, demonstrate building scale black water reuse to the development community 
as I've mentioned before, the state is um, the only, I guess I didn't mention it, but the state of Texas is the only one who can issue a, a permit for black water reuse within a building. And so um, we are kind of the guinea pig, the first to do this in a building where then you have a backup to the city sewer. So we're the first ones to test out how you would get a system like this permitted in, in the state of Texas and then the city. And so there have been some bumps along the road, but we're kind of working them out um, and <laughs> in anticipation that other buildings might incorporate black water reuse in the future. And then we have the City of Austin Central Library. Uh, that's an interesting integrated system with multiple sources, that rainwater and AC condensate. And then that system is also backed up with the city's reclaimed water supply. So at no time should you have to use potable water for non-potable demands because the backup is also another non-potable source. Um, the storage system also uh, is a dual purpose 700,000 gallon below grade cistern that also um, accommodates the water quality volume for um, collecting rainwater and stormwater. Um, and, and helping uh, treat and detain that on site. And that system has an annual potable water offset of about 1.88 million gallons each year. The city is also uh, has applied for and was awarded funding to research costs associated with dual plumbing, um, actual, develop, uh, actual developments in Austin. And so as part of that project, uh, uh, the, the um, the, uh, sorry, the, the awardee will have to determine using actual developments in Austin, a dual plumbing, a cost to um, dual plumb that for non-potable distribution. Some of the buildings will um, look at what the cost is to dual uh, drain for gray water. Um, and so that will help uh, provide us with a key piece of information about costs associated with implementing on-site reuse in your building. Uh, that study is estimated to be completed uh, by the end of this year, 2019. Um, and then a couple of other things we're working on is water balance calculator to assist developers with on-site reuse projects. It should, by putting in basic information about your <coughs> development, the information that you would have at the site plan stage, you can get a pretty good idea of on available on-site um, supplies and then what your non-potable demands will be. And we're going to talk about this calculator at, in the workshop this afternoon. And then we're also working on streamlining, streamlining the permitting process to make it easier um, to get a project permitted and through the city's uh, development process um, so that there are uh, as, as few hiccups as possible for you to incorporate these systems into your building. And that's the book.